Chapter 14 of D99 by H.B. Fife. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. Pauline came back in a quarter of an hour, her youthfully translucent skin glowing and her ash-blonde curls rearranged. She glanced through the window at Beryl, who was nervously punching a number for an outside call. "'What's going on?' she asked Westervelt, who sat with his heels on the center desk. "'Mr. Smith is calling a couple of engineers he knows,' Simonetta told her. Westervelt had just heard it, when Simonetta had emerged with the tape to transcribe. He had started to mention that it might be better to phone a psychiatrist, but had bitten back the remark. "'For all I know,' he reflected, "'they might take me away. Everything I remember about today can't really have happened.' If it did, I wish it hadn't. He recalled that he had been phoned at home to hop a jet for London that morning. He had found the laboratory which had made the model of the light Smith was interested in, and been on his way back without time for lunch. Now that the jets were so fast, meals were no longer served on them, and he had had to grab a sandwich upon returning. Then there had been those poor fried eggs. That was all. No wonder he was feeling hungry again. I should have missed the return jet, he thought bitterly. I didn't know where I was well off. Why did I have to walk in there? I might have had the sense to go look in Bob's office first. He decided that Pauline, now chatting with Simonetta, looked refreshed and relaxed. Perhaps he ought to do the same. The idea, upon reflection, continued to appear attractive. Westerbelt rose and walked out past the switchboard. Beryl was too busy to see him. He made his way quietly to the restroom, which he found empty. He was rather relieved to have avoided everyone. At one side of the room was a door leading to a shower. The appointments of Department 99 were at least as complete as those of any modern business office of the day. Westervelt stepped into a tiny ante room, furnished with a skimpy stool, several hooks on the wall, and a built-in towel supplier. Prudently, he set the temperature for a hot shower on the dial outside the shower compartment and punched the button that turned on the water. Just in case all the trouble has affected the hot water supply, he thought. As he undressed, he was reassured by the sight of steam inside the stall. Another thought struck him. He locked the outer door. He did not care for the possibility of having Leidman imagine that he was trapped in here. It would be just his luck to be assisted out into the corridor, naked and dripping, at the precise moment it was full of staff members on their way to the laboratory. He slid back the partly opaque plastic doors and stepped with a sigh of pleasure under the hot stream. Ten minutes of it relaxed him to the point of feeling almost at peace with the world once more. I ought to finish with a minute or two of cold, he told himself, but to hell with it. I'll set the air on cool later. He pushed the waterproof button on the inside of the stall to turn off the water, opened the narrow doors, and reached out to the towel dispenser. The towel he got was fluffy and large, though made of paper. He blotted himself off well before turning on the air jets in the stall to complete the drying process. Having dressed and disposed of the towel through a slot in the wall, he glanced about to see if he had forgotten anything. The shower stall had automatically aired itself, sucking all moisture into the air conditioning system, and looked as untouched as it had at his entrance. Westervelt strolled out into the restroom proper, thankful that the lock in the anteroom door had not chosen that moment to stick. He stretched and yawned comfortably. Then he caught sight of his tousled, air-blown hair in a mirror. He fished in his pocket for coins and bought another hard paper comb and a small vial of hairdressing from dispensers mounted on the wall. He took his time spraying the vaguely perfumed mist over his dark hair and combing it neatly. That task attended to, he stole a few seconds to study the reflection of his face. It was rather more square about the jaw than Smith's, he thought, but he had to admit that the nose was prominent enough to challenge the chiefs. No one had thought to equip the washroom with adjustable mirrors, so he gave up twisting his neck in an effort to see his profile. Well, that's a lot better, he said, with considerable satisfaction. Now if I can hook another coffee out of the locker, it will be like starting a new day. Gosh, I hope it's a better one, too. He walked lightly along the corridor to the main office, exaggerating the slight resilience of the floor to a definite bounce in his step. Outside the office, he met Beryl coming out. He felt himself coming down on his heels immediately. Beryl eyed him enigmatically, glanced over his shoulder to check that he was alone, and swung away toward the opposite wing. Westervelt hurried after her. Look, Beryl, he called. I wanted to say that is about before. Beryl turned the corner and kept walking. Wait just a second, said Westervelt. He tried to get beside her to speak to something besides the back of her blonde head, but she was a tall girl and had a long stride. He hesitated to take her by the elbow. Beryl stopped at the door to the library. Please take note, Willie, she said coldly, that the light is on inside and I am all alone. At least she spoke, thought Westervelt. I have come down here for a little peace and quiet, she informed him. I hope you didn't intend to learn how to read at this hour of the night. 
Oh, come on, protested Westervelt. It was an accident. Could I help it? Being the way you are, I suppose not, admitted Beryl judiciously. Why don't you go elsewhere and be an accident again? I'm trying to say I'm sorry, said Westervelt, feeling a flush spreading over his features. I don't know why I have to apologize anyway. It wasn't me in there, filing away in the dark. Beryl looked down her nose at him, as if he were a Miserian, asking where he could have his chlorine tank refilled. Is that the story you're telling around? She demanded icily. I'm not telling... Westervelt realized he was beginning to yell and lowered his voice. I'm not telling any story around. Nobody knows anything about it, except you and I and Pete. Bob couldn't have seen anything. Beryl shrugged, a small disdainful gesture. Westerbelt wondered why he had allowed himself to get into an argument over the matter, since it was obvious that he was making things worse with every word. I don't know why you should be so sore about it, he said. Even Pete said to me I should forget about it. Oh, you two have been talking it over, Beryl accused. Pretty clubby. Do you take over for him on other things, too? Westervelt threw up his hands. You don't seem to mind anything about it except that I should know you were in there with him, he retorted. If he was so acceptable, why am I a disease? Nobody ever left this office on account of me. It could happen yet, said Beryl. Oh, hell. The trouble with you is you need a little loosening up. He grabbed her by the shoulders and yanked her toward him, slipping his left arm behind her back as she tried to kick his ankle. He kissed her. The result was spoiled by Beryl's turning her face away at the crucial instant. Westervelt drew back. The next thing he knew, lights exploded before his right eye. He had not seen her hand come up, or he would have ducked. He saw it as he stepped back, however. Despite a certain feminine delicacy, the hand clenched into a very capable little fist. Beryl took one quick stride into the library. I don't like to keep hinting around, she said, but maybe that will play itself back in your little mind. She slammed the door three inches from his nose. Westervelt raised a hand to open it, then changed his mind and felt gingerly of his eye. It hurt, but with a sort of surrounding numbness. Realizing that he could see after all, he looked up and down the corridor guiltily. It seemed very quiet. Right square in the peeper, he thought ruefully. She couldn't have aimed that well. It must have been a lucky shot. I ought to go in there and belt her. It was not something he really wanted to do. He could not foresee any pleasure or satisfaction in carrying matters to the extent of open war. You lost again, Willie, he argued. You might as well take it like a man. She got annoyed at something you said, like as not, and it was too late when you began. He prodded gently at his eye again and decided that the numb sensation was being caused by the tightening of skin over a growing mouse. He set off up the corridor, past the main door with his face averted, and hurried down to the washroom before someone should come along. Spying out the land through a cautiously open door, he discovered the place unoccupied. In the mirror, the eyes showed definite signs of blossoming. The eyebrow was all right, but the orb itself was bloodshot and tearing freely. Beneath it, the flesh above the cheekbone was pink and puffy. Oh my God, breathed Westervelt. It'll be blue tomorrow. Probably purple and green, in fact. Or does it take a day or two to reach that stage? He ran cold water into a basin and splashed it over his face, holding a palmful at a time against the damaged eye. When this did not seem sufficiently effective, he wadded a soft paper towel, soaked it in water, and applied it until it lost its chill. Am I doing right, he wondered. I can never remember whether it's hot or cold you're supposed to use. He thought about it while holding the slowly disintegrating towel to his eye. Someone had told him, as nearly as he could recall, that either way helped, depending on when heat or cold was applied. Keep the blood from going into the tissues. That must be it. But if you're too late for that, then heat would keep it from stiffening. Now the question is, did I start in time? He examined the eye. It did not feel too sore, but it was still red and slightly swollen. The flow of tears had stopped, so he decided there was little more he could do. He dried his face and walked out into the corridor, blinking. He went to the laboratory door and opened it quietly. The room was dark and unoccupied. Westervelt swore to himself that if he stumbled over anyone this time, he would punch every nose he could reach without further ado. Unless he amended the intention. He ran into Leidman. He was squeamish about turning on a light which left him the problem of groping his way through the maze of tables, workbenches, and stacks of cartons. He set down for future conversation the possibility of claiming that the department was as normal as any other business. It, too, possessed a typical messy back room, out of range of the front office. He had negotiated about half the course when he felt a cool breeze. At first, he thought it must come from an air conditioning diffuser, but it blew more horizontally. Someone must have opened a window, he decided, or perhaps broken one trying out a dangerous instrument. He succeeded in reaching the far wall, where he felt around for the door leading to the communications room. 
This was over near the outside wall, but he reached it without bumping into more than two or three scattered objects. Once through the door, he could see better because a little light was diffused past the wire mesh enclosure around the power equipment. He walked along the short passage formed by this, turned a corner, and came in sight of Joe Rosencrantz sitting before his screen. Hello, Joe, he greeted the operator. The other jumped perceptibly, looking around at the door. It's Willie, said Westerville. I came around the other way. He was pleased to find that Rosencrantz had the room as dimly lighted as was customary among the TV men. Joe stared for a moment at him, and Westerbelt feared that the other's vision was too well adjusted to the light. I didn't think anybody but Leidman used that way much, said Rosencrantz. It's a shortcut, said Westerbelt evasively. He found a spare chair to sit in and inquired as to what might be new. Rosencrantz told him of putting through a few calls to planets near Trident, asking DIR men stationed on them to line up spaceships for possible use either to go after Harris or to ship necessary equipment for plumbing the ocean. He offered to let Westervelt scan the tapes of his traffic. That's a good idea, said the youth gratefully. Even if I don't spot an opening, it will look like useful effort. Yeah, agreed the other. Time drags, doesn't it? Wonder how they're making out down in the cable tunnels. It can't last much longer. That's what this here Harris is saying, too, I should think. Now there's one guy who's really packed away. Well... Oh, they've pulled some good ones around here, but I have a feeling about this one, insisted the operator. I bet ten to one they won't spring Harris. Westerbelt took the tapes to a playback screen and dragged his chair over. I told Smitty they ought to offer to swap for him, he said. At the time, I meant it looked like the perfect way to unload undesirables. Come to think of it, though, I wouldn't mind going myself. What the hell for? asked Rosencrantz. Westerbelt realized that he had nearly given himself away. Oh, just for the chance to see the place, he said. Nobody else has ever seen these Tridentians. How else could somebody like me get a position as an interstellar ambassador? Maybe Harris wants the job for himself. He sure went looking for it. The phone buzzed quietly. Rosencrantz answered it, then said, It's for you. Westervelt went to the screen. It was Smith. I thought you must have found a way out, Willie. Where did you get to? Westervelt explained that he was looking at the tapes of the Trident calls to familiarize himself with the background. I figured there was plenty of time for me to... He broke off as he saw Rosencrantz straighten up to focus in a call from space. Joe is receiving something right now. I'll let you know if it has anything to do with Trident. Department 99, Terra, the operator was saying when Westervelt turned from the phone, as if the mere call signal had not satisfied the party at the other end. Department 99, Terra. There seemed to be a lot of action on the screen. Men were running in various directions in what appeared to be a large hall with an impressive stairway. Yolene, Rosencrantz flung over his shoulder. Tell Smitty. Mr. Smith, said Westervelt, turning back to the phone screen. Joe says it's Yolene coming in. Maybe you'd like to see it yourself. Something looks wrong. Coming, said Smith, and the phone went dark. Westervelt looked around to see that most of the running figures had hidden themselves. A voice was coming over, and he listened with the operator. Knocked apart, so I have to use one of the observation lenses they have planted around the embassy. He's shooting up the place good. I'm taping until someone gets here, said Rosencrantz. Better tell me what happened, just in case. Yolene, thought Westervelt. That would be, let me see, Gerson, the kidnap case. Do they mean that he's shooting them up? And after he left me with this mess in the calm room, he headed for the stairs, said the voice of the unseen operator. He seems to be trying to get out of the embassy. We don't know why. The boys got him there without any trouble. Was he all right? asked Rosencrantz, cocking an ear at the door. He looked pretty sick, as if he wasn't eating well, and he had a broken wrist. They took him along to the doctor with no trouble. Then the chief went up to see how he was and found Doc out cold on the floor. He set up a yell, naturally. Someone finally caught up with Gerson in the military attache's office. What did he want there? asked Rosencrantz. We don't know yet. He left a corpse for us that isn't answering questions. End of chapter 14